can cause God to stop his ears when you pray. That your prayers be not hindered. And so, how we treat those at home Amen. will determine whether we are saved or not. Amen. Amen. I want to read to you what Ellen White has to say. She says, just as you conduct yourself in your home life, you are registered in the books of heaven. So it is not how well we come to church that we'll be saved by. It is not how we perform on the job. or at school, or a play. We are judged and we are registered in the books of heaven on the basis of who we are at home. And you know why? Elsewhere we can always pretend. But in our home, we are always who we really are. She says further, he who would become a saint in heaven must first become a saint in his own family. So do we understand then why family life, the marriage and family department of the church is extremely important? As a matter of fact, I consider it the most important. You know why? The church is made up of families. And if the church is to have a powerful impact on the world, then we need to have good families. For it is the families that make up the church. But if we have broken families, then the church will be making a broken impact on the world. So it's all about family. If fathers and mothers are true Christians in the family, they will be useful members of the church and be able to conduct affairs in the church and the society after the same manner in which they conduct their family concerns. Parents, let not your religion be simply a profession, but let it become a reality. Amen. And so today, friends, I want to share with us three secrets to a happy home. Is that okay? Three secrets. I would tell you to take your pencil and paper and write, but you know you have this, the tape to access later, so that's okay. But if you want to write, that's good. That's okay too. Three secrets to a happy marriage. Number one, love unconditionally. What is it? Love unconditionally. Let me see the hands of those who are married here. Your wife or husband may not be here, but you are married. Raise the hand. Hello. If you're, if you're proud of it, just put your hands in the air. Amen. Amen. That's all right. Good, good, good. Now, let me see the hands of those who hope to get married one day. Amen. That's all right. That's okay, too. Beautiful. Beautiful. Now, so my message will have much relevance today, okay? <clears throat> Love unconditionally. Will you please put on the screen from Romans 5 and verse 8. If we want to know how to do relationship, let us follow how God does relationship. Because, you see, relationship began with God. He 
is the originator. When God said to the, 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 the Trinity, let us. That's when relationship started. He was talking to the other members of the Godhead. Let us. That's the first instance of relationship in history. Relationship began with God. And so if we want to know how to do relationship, we must love conditionally and do it God's way. God does not love because we are good. He loves us in spite of, not because of. Amen. And so the Bible says that God demonstrates his love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. He didn't die for us because we were good. He didn't love us because we were good. He loves us even though we were, we were messed up in our dirt and the filthy. He came and he rescued us Amen. from the uttermost and to bring us to the uttermost. That's, this should be our mentality in loving. We love unconditionally. I saw a picture one day. The rain was falling, and the husband, of course, it seems like they had a little altercation in the family, in the marriage. The rain was falling. Both of them were sitting on the seat in the park. They, they, they. They turned their backs to each other. The husband had the umbrella. But he still held it over the wife. Amen. <laughs> you see, when we make a commitment to love, we don't love based on feelings. We love based on principle. And even though we don't feel like it and we have an altercation with each other, we still care for each other. Amen. That's commitment. That's unconditional love. You're not going to be always in the skies sailing on the flowery beds of ease. You're not going to be always on the tip of the mountain. No. There's going to be some valley moments. But you don't abuse each other and, and threaten I'm going to leave. I'm not coming back. No. You still love. For that's commitment. So you love unconditionally. You love. So even when the faults of your, your partner pop up, even when you see their faults, you don't rent and rave and put them down and tell them off. You know good. I know you were like this long time. You're just like the grandmother. And you reel the words, and you reel the words, and you will not stop until you reduce them to tears. Verbally assassinating. When you see their faults and their mishaps and their misgivings and their annoying traits, you forgot you made a commitment to love and to cherish. How is that cherishing? We don't understand the scope of commitment. 
no relationship with. The scope of commitment. That even though the world is falling apart, we still love each other. Love unconditionally. Love unconditionally. So we don't love by feelings. We love by principle. Is that clear? We don't love by feelings. We love by principle. We don't always feel like it. No, but we do it anyway. We don't love by feelings. We love by principle. <laughs> we are disciplined. Is that right? The Apostle Paul says, I bring my body under subjection. That's self-restraint. That's discipline. Did you know there can be no happy marriage without discipline? Impossible. You're going around and you see these men and women talking to each other. Anything that anything they think it, they think it and they speak it. There is no filter on the lips. They think it and they say it. And they use words with each other that would make the angels turn their faces aside. God cannot take the sight. He feels it. Words. Sometimes, my friends, the words couples, some couples use in their home to each other. You wonder what's happening here. But when we marry, we must make a commitment to discipline. We cannot just think it and speak it. <laughs> You know, somebody asked the question, why do men cheat? Okay, you know, that's what I'm dealing with all, all along, right? That's my special, right? Always hearing those stories, right? Why do men cheat? If a man does not possess discipline, don't expect him not to cheat. Amen. 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 That's the only thing. That's the only thing Amen. that's going to keep him. Discipline. That's how God makes him. He has a natural attraction. But it is what? Discipline. So, you can't marry anybody. A person who is not, who has not given his life to God and has not demonstrated a sense of discipline, you could be fighting a losing battle. Discipline. Another thing with discipline, friends, is that even the words that come from your mouth, sometimes you may feel in your marriage as though you should just let it out and speak anyhow and yell at your spouse and tell them off. But discipline will, will cause you to zip. Amen. Knowing that if you, pro, if, you, if you allow those words, those missiles to drip from your lips, they may create such damage that you regret for the rest of your life. But with discipline, you don't say them. And that's the problem with marriage. Discipline. <laughs> and so in the church, we should be having good marriages. For we have the formula. Friends, we don't 
we, when we treat people, we, realize, we remember that people are not things. People are emotional beings. People have feelings. And so we can't just utter words, any kind of word to each other. The Bible reminds us, evil communication corrupt good manners. If you continue to utter words that destroy evil communication, after a while you have no marriage. <laughs> the sweetness is gone. Somebody said, you know, he saw two people, two people walking on the street, a man and a woman, you know, and they were holding hands. And they were happy. You know what he said? He said, wow, look at that. That looks so good. Either they are still dating or they just got married. Isn't that a sad commentary about marriage? Yeah. What he's saying is that, okay, the longer you live together, that cannot happen. The worse you get. That's what he's saying. In other words, it's impossible for two people to live together 5, 10, 15 years and still be sweet. And you know why? Because over time, they have got so accustomed to using words that discredit each other. Careless, reckless words that all romance, all sweetness is hemorrhaged from the relationship. Mm -mm 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 -mm. We don't understand the power of our words. After 27 years, I've found no weapon more dangerous, more effective to destroy relationships than words. The unbridled tongue. The ill-advised speech, the impatient words and language, words, words, and we, we utter it so freely. <laughs> we utter it so freely. I've heard a couple already talking to each other, look at you. <laughs> You're no good. <laughs> and they hurt each other in a joke. They have got accustomed, so accustomed to using negative words that stuff no consequence anymore. The husband coming through the door and he dressed a certain way. Oh, look at you. <laughs> Why are you dressed like that? You dress like a poor man. You're and they just use words so lightly. The guy said to the girl in marriage, you know, oh, look at her. You're such a simple, you're so idiotic. <laughs> Words. Mm. It's so simple, huh? But they go to bed the night. And as they sleep, those words sift through their minds. And when conscience gets a hearing, <laughs> they think about it. Why did he say that? Who was she really talking to? And they get up in the morning and they are depressed. They cannot put their finger on it. But they are depressed. You know why? They feel discredited, disparaged, berated, demeaned, belittled, dehumanized, 
and their self-esteem has been eroded. They get up and they're depressed. And just like that little bad little, the romance disappears from the marriage. Friends, you know, even in our marriage, we should be careful of the, how we use words with each other. Let me share with you what Ellen White has to say about that. There's a quote here. Listen to what she says. <clears throat> Listen to this. We're talking about the joking. The word said in form of a joke that destroy relationships. She says, in your married life, seek to elevate one another. <clears throat> Show the high and elevating principles of the holy faith in your everyday conversations. In your everyday conversations. And in your most private walks of life. Listen to this. Be ever careful and tender of the feelings of one another. For we are dealing with human beings, not things. Emotional beings. People that can be hurt. That have a heart. A tender heart. I read a book some time ago. He says you cannot afford the legacy of a negative thought. It carries too much with it. She says further. She says, watch this. Do not allow, watch the joking now, watch this. Do not allow a playful, bantering, joking, censuring of one another. She says, these things are dangerous. They wound. Hello, watch this now further. She says, the wound may not be concealed. Oh, everybody's smiling. <laughs> oh, we just had a little joke last night. You see, we were laughing. They told me off. Well, I took it for a joke. Really? She says, these things, the wound may be concealed, may be hidden. Nevertheless, the wound exists. And peace is being sacrificed and happiness endangered. So young people, I came here to serve your notice. If you are hanging around some boy, some girl, and they're always negative, Ellen White says it seems as though the minds of some are, 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 are cemented in negativity. They are not the one for you. Amen. Rooted in negatives. And so, we should take a positive approach to our relationships. Amen? Amen. Yes, a positive approach. Regardless of what happened, we're going to be loving each other still. So, love unconditionally, and for us to do that, we must exercise discipline. Discipline. Oh, we just got married two years, but he's still going out and coming in 4 a.m., 4 o'clock in the morning. What's up, man? Oh, or, you know, every night when I'm going to sleep, 11 o'clock, he leaves and he's going to the club. You're married. But you know why? When folk were single, that's how they lived. But when you get married, you must have a change of mindset. You are now accountable to another person. There's a difference. Many have not made the transition from singleness to married life. And so they are living married, but as, as the old single. There is no discipline. Oh, you know, let me say something more. Love unconditionally. 
Love unconditional. Because, you know, friends, a lot of young people getting married, but they don't know what love is. Oh, it feels so good when I touch her. Oh, I can't even eat. <laughs> when I see her, oof, I'm having sleepless nights. One professor at college says, you know, he said, yes, some of these young boys sometimes, you know, man, when, and these, you know, they, you, you, you know, they go to school, you know, and they, they go back to class, you know, and they think about the girls so much, even they're, even when they're writing, they just see little girls jumping up on, on the paper, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's real. Yeah, that's not your God made us that way, isn't that right? Yes. But you see, and they think that, okay, this feels so good. How can it be wrong? I want to get married tomorrow. And they marry based on feelings. And they thought that that was love. That's not love. That's chemical reaction. Amen. Eh? That's what you call infatuation. Okay? <laughs> that's, that's the secretion of the dopamine. Right? And the serotonin. Okay? The, the chemicals being secreted in the brain and it makes you feel good. But that's not love. In other words, we have another word for it. Sometimes they call it lust. But I prefer to say infatuation. Can I give you a little definition for love? Can we talking to the young people as well? Is that right? Ellen White here gives a beautiful definition that I like so much when I preserve this quote. She says, listen to this. <clears throat> she says, true love is not a strong, fiery, impetuous passion. <laughs> oh, man. You know, because, you know, that's what... Many interpret as love. Is that right? Oh, well. And even though, man, the, the man is even, you come home to the mother, and the mother says, I don't think he's the right one for you. He says, what? He's the one I dream about. But, but, but he's an ex-con. He's a serial killer. No, but I don't care about that. He's the one I love. That's not love. What you feel, what? Is a strong, fiery, impetuous passion. But that's not love. On the contrary, what is love? It is calm and deep in its nature. Watch this now. It looks beyond mere externals. Mm -mm -mm. And is attracted by qualities alone. Hello today. He says, it is wise and discriminating. And its devotion is real and abiding. Mm -mm 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 -mm. There's a lot in that. Oh, we could unpack that. I wrote, I put this quote you know, on my Facebook page. I said, you know, friend, if you, if you plan to have a, uh, some lasting relationship, I'd like you to ponder this statement. And I'd like you to understand the meaning and definition and import of every word and every phrase in it. Study it. Explore it. Watch this. Watch this. It says, it is calm and deep in its nature. It ponders what it sees. It's deep. It's not just a fleeting sense of passion. It's not just a superficial expression of excitement. No, it's deep and abiding. It ponders it. Then it says, it looks beyond mere externals. It's not just the car. <laughs> That's good. It's not just the house. That's good. It's not just, it's not just the, 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 the phys physique. That's good. All of those are good. But it's not that. It looks beyond that. And it evaluates. One of the things I normally say, even to my singles, I says, what? You evaluate before you engage. There's got to be some thinking. Is that just what you see? I say, oh, I'm ready to go the extra mile. I'm ready to take it to the next level. No. 
The Bible says what man is want to build a house and he does not first sit down and put pen to paper and evaluate whether it can stand the test of time. Sometimes young people will make decisions based on emotion. If I were to ask some young man, you know, oh, oh, if you had the choice of a car to buy for a lifetime, what car would you want to buy? You know what some young people would say? Ooh, well, if I were to ask you, you know what some of you would say? I want to ask the average high schooler, what car would you buy to keep for the rest of your life? Oh, I want a Lamborghini. Woohoo! But are you thinking long term? When you start to have children, where are you going to put the stroller in that little two door car? In other words, you have to consider all variables. <laughs> Isn't that right? In the same way, some when choosing a partner. <laughs> and, and they're dazzled. But you have to think long term. Can they carry on for the long haul? Can they sustain a relationship for the long haul? And for that to happen, the person must possess character. The Bible reminds us. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Amen. Amen. It's more than just the externals. Then he says, it's attracted by qualities alone. Amen. By what? Qualities. qualities. That's love. Qualities. So young people, before you even start a relationship, you, you put pen to paper and say, this is what I'm looking for in a partner. This is what I'm looking for in a partner, okay? First of all, if I'm a Christian, then they must be a Christian too. Is that right? They must serve God too. And why? Because if they don't serve God, then we can't go to church together, we can't pray together, we can't worship together. We can't have conversation where there is a reasonable feedback. We, we can't be happy in our conversation. I go to church and hear a good sermon. I, God does something for me. I have nobody to share it with. So you put pen to paper first of all. You set boundaries. It must be this. It must be that. And you know, you have what we call negotiable and non-negotiable boundaries. These are some non-negotiable boundaries, okay? If you have this as a boundary, no unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. If you have this as a boundary, you won't get caught. Amen. Amen. For whenever you meet him the first time, hello today, and he said, do you love God? Are you a baptized member of the church? He said, no, but I'm trying. Well, if he, once he says that, you know there will not be a second interview. Amen. For that's a non-negotiable boundary. You evaluate. If you don't do that, you can easily be captured and carried away by emotion. Emotion is powerful. You start kissing each other. Wow. You forget everything about all the things you learned in Sabbath school. <laughs> I only want to see him again. I can't wait. <laughs> what time is it? <laughs> is he coming? <laughs> Emotion is powerful. You set the boundaries. The reason why a lot of young people get caught in 
teenage pregnancy and all kinds of problems because they did not set boundaries. They did not hold on to it. <laughs> Hello today. But if we are to do a relationship, we must do it God's way. When God made Adam and Eve, man, he set boundaries. Isn't that right? He says, of all the fruits in the garden, you may freely eat or enjoy everything but this one. This one. Why did God have boundaries? Is it because he hates us? No. It's because he loves us and he knows if we venture beyond the borders of safety, it is trouble out there. So he sets the fence, the barbed wire, to keep us inside. Sometime ago, while we were living in New York, my second son was very young. He was maybe two or three. We had a gate. And We tried to keep the gate closed as a boundary. But we were playing ball on the inside, inside the yard, the backyard. <clears throat> and somehow the ball got through the gate, went to the road. When we looked, we said, where is Daniel? It was about maybe three. He ran out through the gate after the ball. And there was a bone to go across the road. Oh, I saw my wife turned red. <laughs> she sailed through the gate, man. And all of us, we ran to the road and we captured him. And my wife just started crying. Just what might have been if he had gone across the road. Every time I preach this message, I remember that incident. The boundary is to keep us safe. That's why God puts a boundary, put a fence. Because he knows if we go through the gate, we don't even have the understanding. We don't have the wisdom to navigate it right. And there are foxes and wolves out there to eat us alive. So God puts a boundary. In your relationship, you must have boundaries. If not, you may venture through the gates. And the rest of your life may be characterized by pain and heartache. We must live within the boundary. Friends, my time is gone. I'm just a number one. How to create a happy marriage, love unconditionally. But you know, in five minutes, I'm going to close the other two. The second one is put your spouse's priority and needs above your own. Amen. Amen. Mm, there is no selfishness, friends, in a happy marriage. What do you say? Mm -mm -mm. Put your Spouse's priority and needs above your own. There's a passage of scripture that I love. Romans 12 and verse 10. You know what it says? He says, be kindly, affectioned, one to another with brotherly love. And then he says, in honor, preferring one another. You know what that word prefer means? It means putting the other above yourself. Preferring. When you study that word in the original language, it means putting the other above yourself. Putting their needs and priorities above your own. Hello today. Mm -mm -mm. 
Another rendering of the Bible puts it this way. He says, outdo each other in showing honor. Amen. I remember the early days, my and my wife and I, when we just got married, you know, sometimes we'd make a little challenge with each other. And we said, sweetheart, let's see who can out love the other. Amen. That's how you do it, isn't that right? You, you live to outdo the other in showing love. Friends, let me tell you that because of that, that principle stayed with us now 16 years after. I was telling somebody the other day that right now the relationship with me and my wife is sweeter than when we were dating. Amen. Watch this now. That's going to bring me to number three. That's going to bring me to number three. I'm just cutting it. That brings me to number three. You know what number three is? It says, use honorable language. It says, celebrate each other. Amen. Is that right? When you got, get married, your life must not be about negativity. No, you flip the script. Is that right? And you celebrate one another. Oh, yes. The Bible is about praise. God says, I inhabit, I live in, I delight, I inhabit the praise of my people. Why did God make us? God made us so we can praise him. Amen. Why won't you praise your spouse? Why won't you praise your spouse? I tell people when you get up in the morning, the first thing, and you know, you reach over your hand, you know, I like to reach over my hand and touch the head of my wife, you know, and pass my fingers through her hair, you know, and say, you're the most beautiful thing that ever happened to me. Amen. If I were to do it again, it would still be you. Is that right? Did you know that the virtuous woman of Proverbs, you know, one of the things that made her virtuous? Because she had a husband that praised her. I want to read that text for you today. I'm going to read a text for you today. Proverbs 31 and verse 28. He's not right. What the Bible says? He says, her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also and praiseth her. Amen. In your home, the only language you speak in your home must be to celebrate one another. Oh, in your home, create a culture of appreciation. Everything in your home. Sometimes I say to my clients, go home and every morning, two assignments, this is your assignment. Every morning you get up, you do two things. You search for, identify, and acknowledge two things about your spouse that you can praise them for. Then you begin by saying, you begin with the statement, I appreciate you for, and you fill in the blanks. What about that? Yeah. Friends, let me tell you this. Every morning you get up, the first thing you should do is to praise your spouse. And ladies, let me tell you this. Do you know that even if you have a bad husband, the Bible says you can win him. Is that right? First Peter 3 and verse 6. He said, win him, not by your words. No, not by being nitpicky. Oh, I, I did this for you, and you don't know me. They don't appreciate it. Not by, no, he says, by your chaste conduct. Did you know you can win him? Oh, I wish I had some time. I'll have a little module where I teach. I say how to win back your spouse. These are signs in it. I have another module where I talk about how to become the attractive spouse. How do you do it? <laughs> I think I want to end there. How do you become the attractive spouse? <laughs> Yesterday I wrote on my Facebook page, you know, every day I like to write because of a lot of people, you know, sometimes I have to reach out to. And I said, yesterday, I said, if your spouse came to you and said, I'm not attracted to you anymore, what are you going to do? I know what some people do. They rant and rave. Ah, how can you say that? I've been with you for so long. How can you say that? Ah, you are no good. You're not appreciative. Not at all. I said, when you do that, would that help? If already he thinks you are not attractive, how? In other words, if he was thinking of staying with you six more months and you come and tell him that, he reduces it to two months. 
Because that makes you look more unattractive. In other words, what is EQ? Let's talk a little about EQ. Oh man, I wish I had all day. My wife told me, you know, she says, she knows sometimes, you know, she says, set a time. <laughs> One of these days we'll have eternity. Can I spend, can you give me two minutes more? Can you give me two minutes more? Oh, friends, what is EQ? <laughs> My wife is compassionate. Amen. <laughs> what is EQ? Emotional intelligence. How do you know whether you have emotional intelligence? In other words, for you to have a happy home, you need emotional intelligence. That's one component of attractiveness. There are four of them, and that's one. E, Q, emotional intelligence. How do you know you have emotional intelligence? One way to know it, friend, to measure it is this. How do they, how do I make them feel when they are in my presence? Is that clear? Then you'll know whether your husband or your wife thinks you have emotional intelligence. So how do you make your spouse feel when they are in your presence? Do you make them feel like a pea on the seashore, nobody? Or do you make them feel like a superstar? The way to attract people and to make, make yourself the attractive spouse. Okay, friends? You know how you do that? You celebrate them. <laughs> you celebrate them. Oh. If this microphone could follow me, I would be down there, right? Talking to you a little, right? But listen to me. You what? Celebrate them. Is that right? Let me give you the signs behind that, friends. There's something we call D-O-S-E. Are you with me? D-O-S-E. These are, 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 are neurotransmitters released in the brain of your spouse. Watch this now, friends. When you utter a word of praise to them, it releases what we call the dopamine. Is that clear? The dopamine, that's a neurotransmitter. It's chemical released in the brain, and it makes them feel good. Is that clear? D, dopamine. O. Oh. S, E, endorphins, serotonin, estrogen. Those four hormones are secreted in the brain when you praise people. It makes them feel good. It's like drugs. That's what people feel when they smoke cocaine. The dopamine is released in the brain. It's a feel-good hormone. And they feel that, wow, it feels so good. I must have it again. And they'll go the extra mile, sell their car to get the money just to buy it again. Because that, feel, that feeling, I must have it again. Friends, when you praise your spouse, that dopamine is secreted. And they say, wow, she makes me feel good. He makes me feel good. I want to be in his presence all the time. Five o'clock at work. And she's looking at the clock. I say, I can't wait. I can't wait to get home, man. You see her speeding on the road. The cop is following her. Why are you speeding like this? Because I have my dopamine at home. Amen. 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 That's, that's the source of her pleasure. Her joy. Somebody that prays her. Oh, friends, let me tell you something. We start the day sometimes. I praise my wife after a while. She's dancing in the house. She's singing everything. She goes to work in joy. 10 o'clock one morning, she calls me. She says, sweetheart, where are you? I finished one round of my work. Are you nearby? I said, okay, I'm coming back, taking the kids to school. You know, we met up at 10 a.m. And she left work. We met up at some place, you know, and we had a little breakfast and we sat again in dining and we just enjoying each other again just to have another moment with each other was good enough Amen. 
because she's my girlfriend. Amen. That's the secret to a happy home. Understand how the brain works. When somebody is putting you down all the time, you want to flee their presence. And that's one of the reasons why we have infidelity. You know one of the reasons we have infidelity? It is because of what we call marital void. There's a void in the marriage. <clears throat> and all that is necessary for a thorn to grow is a crack in the sidewalk. So I say to Holmes, I said to home, seal the crack, amen? amen? Seal the crack so that the thorns won't grow. Amen. Praise your spouse. Celebrate them. Scan the atmosphere to catch them doing good. But whatever you do, praise your spouse. Amen. Honor him. Love him. Praise her. Respect him. Celebrate him. Love her with your words. And when you do that, your home will be a little heaven on earth. The children will delight to dwell there. And the angels too will make it a blessed place. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the What a blessing. Amen. Praise the Lord, saints. What a blessing to those who are married and those who are not married. Truly, we were blessed today. And I hope that you have listened and you will follow some of these, this advice that Pastor has given to you. To bring this wonderful time to a close, we will stand and sing number 655, Happy the Home. close I'm going to ask my wife to sing two verses of a song and then we'll pray can you please come love
I give you Jesus. Could you sit for a moment, please? Yeah. I don't want to keep you standing. And then after that, I'll pray. Give yourself to the Lord. say trust your heart to the Lord friends we can trust his word is not right he gave us the formula in his word 